Version control is a fundamental of software development, and Git is the king of version control. In a recent post, online magazine InfoWorld asked the question, what comes next? What's beyond Git? I think that this is the wrong question, or at least less interesting question. And I think that the right question is both scarier and goes a lot deeper into what we really mean when we talk about version control. So let's take a look. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery and welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. Version control is a key idea in software development. It's fundamental to controlling the variables, allowing us to build on sounder foundations. But we often forget how important it is and often fail to take advantage of the power that it gives us. Fundamentally, version control is about being definitive, precise about the versions of software that we are using in any given context. If you can't exactly reproduce your software as it was at some point in its history, then you aren't taking real advantage of version control. Version control allows me to define what I mean when I want the answer to questions like, do all the pieces of my application work together? Without version control, I can't tell what all of the pieces that allow my software to work or stop it from working really are. Despite this foundational value, I think that it's a tool whose importance we often undervalue to our cost. Version control is a cornerstone of continuous integration and continuous delivery. Neither really make much sense without the foundation of good version control. And what version control brings to the party are two things a clear definition of what comprises a particular version of our code, the set of things that make our system a coherent whole, but also, crucially, the ability to step back to any previous set of those things accurately, so that we can recreate them together in a working form. This reproducibility is the foundation of continuous integration and continuous delivery. Our aim is to be able to recreate our system accurately enough at any time so that we will get the same results every time. In this episode, I want to describe the central role of version control, but also to highlight three vitally important ways in which we're currently disregarding its value as a tool, and why that is so much more important than whatever comes next after Git, which if we're not careful, will represent an enormous step backwards, however AI-driven the future of software development may turn out to be. Let me pause there and say thank you to our sponsors. We're extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Transfic and Semaphore. All of these companies offer us products and services that are well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and in software engineering, click on the links in the description below and do check them out. Depending on how you think about software development, this idea of reproducibility as a foundational aspect of it may either seem screamingly obvious or perhaps rather strange. Of course version control means being able to recreate versions of our system, but that's only true when we choose to take advantage of the benefits that it offers us. If I have two applications, two services, two components, two functions, two or more of anything in fact, how can I tell that they work together? Well, there are two parts to answering this question. Are they meant to work together? And do they? Version control is a tool that we can use to explicitly define the parts that are meant to work together. And that helps a lot with solving this second problem too, confirming that the things do in fact work together. If we put service A and service B into the same repo, we are saying that the repo defines a sensible scope of evaluation that we're willing to defend in some way. Things outside the repo aren't as important to our system as the things inside. This has implications for how we work. It means that we can assume that everything at the same version is intended to work together. The version control scope defines this relationship. Only once we have that definition can we sensibly verify that the pieces that we expect to work together actually do. Even if this test of the pieces working together only takes the form of us releasing the software into production and crossing our fingers, 
and hoping that things aren't too bad, it's still the same thing. We're still evaluating a known defined specific version of the code when we do that. Without that, we're simply betting on random chance and guesswork. If version 5 of service A plus version 17 of service B is represented as version 2 of our application and version 2 has 34 bugs, we can only create exactly that combination of software complete with its 34 bugs and start to fix them if we have version controlled those relationships somewhere. If we fix 15 of the bugs in release 2.1 and 16 in version 2.2, we can now be confident that version 2.2, as long as it was built on top of 2.1, will now have only three of the original bugs left. Version control gives us predictability and determinism. It allows us to make incremental progress that without it, we wouldn't be possible. Even more importantly, if we fix 31 bugs in 2.2, but then introduce a disastrous bug in our next release, 2.3, we can step back to the more stable 2.2 and try again. This is even more important to our ability to make incremental progress, which relies fundamentally on our ability to build on what we had before, to accurately re-establish a known set of software, and so reliably and repeatably recreate specific versions of our code and systems. This ability to step back to safe, stable versions when we make a mistake is vital and central to our ability to build complex systems. This value is so important, so foundational to effective ways of working, that I think that all of this should make us think very, very carefully about how best to use this powerful tool, but it often doesn't seem to. It seems to me that we often discard this advantage far too easily, and with too little consideration of the value that we're throwing away when we do. This is true in a variety of circumstances. For example, how do you define the boundaries of your code repositories? A large proportion of the teams that I meet appear to do this somewhat arbitrarily. One repo per service or per team, perhaps. So where are the dependencies and relationships between the service or teams defined? Often nowhere. So the systems are no longer reproducible, not repeatable, without lots of additional, often very complicated work. Work that you could have been handled by simply using version control to establish and recreate the relationships that really matter to you. This brings us back to the old topic of this channel, the problem of microservices, which I think boils down to how we choose to exert control over the versions of our software. If A depends on B, we can encode the exact versions of A and B that we know work together, which is most easily done by using the tools that we have at our disposal that allow us to do that, version control. Or we can design A and B so that they don't care which versions the other is at, because they'll always work together. The crazy option, which is nearly what everyone prefers, is to care very much about the versions of A and B, meaning that we must test the exact versions that we put into production together before we put them into production, but not to version control the, and define what those versions are. This is the first of my three irrational failures to apply version control adequately. We should use version control to control the versions that work together. My last example is probably one of the biggest challenges that we face in the future of software development, but more of that later. Before we get to that is a failure that I think has severely limited the adoption of tools that should make programming easier for all of us. The failure to use version control in nearly every user programming system that I've ever seen, but in particular in low or no code systems. I describe this in more detail in this video. Low-code and no-code systems are still programming, and programming is still a complicated thing, even if we don't do quite so much typing. The value of version control is allowing us to recover from missteps. It doesn't go away with low or no-code programming systems. Perhaps the most familiar examples of this kind of failure are in spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are probably one of the commonest forms of widely used user programming systems. Certainly the most common spreadsheets like Excel are also sophisticated programming platforms these days, but they often look more like toys compared to modern programming practice in their use of ideas like version control and testing. The result of this is that very commonly serious business errors are the results of mistakes in spreadsheets. Austerity, the UK Conservative Party's 2010 policy, was based on a mistake in a spreadsheet. 
it calculated that a country's economy would shrink when its debt exceeded 90% of GDP, when in fact it continues to grow. The result of this spreadsheet error, or at least the austerity policy that resulted from it, is estimated at in excess of 120,000 deaths in the UK population. Clearly this kind of failure is about more than only version control, but version control, as we've already discussed it, allows us to safely step back from mistakes and version control allied with the policy of making progress in small steps give us a form of fine-grained control that is otherwise missing altogether. And in combination with testing, each small change allows us to exert much greater control to engineer software that we create, rather than only cross our fingers and hope that our calculations were right the first time without checking them properly. The last in my list of three is possibly even a bigger deal for the future though. Everyone that I talk to these days is obsessed with the idea of AI and its impact on coding. This is not surprising. AI holds out the promise of cheap, easy access to almost instant results in software development. I know that there's a lot more to it than only that, but that's the commercial lure for many, many companies in the software development industry. But how does AI write code? Mostly, it does it the way that most naive beginners assume that we should all write code. We should think really hard and then the solution arrives in our minds, fully formed as though a gift of inspiration from the coding gods. But that is now real software systems are built. Software is always built incrementally in a series of small steps. With reflection after each small step and frequent explorations, missteps and changes of direction along the way. As we learn more and more about the nature of the problem we're solving and our particular solution to it, the effectiveness of our design choices and so on, we change our minds and alter course, building on what went before. So being able to restart when we take a misstep is essential, fundamental to the practice of software development. You can think of this in terms of our cognitive limits. However smart we are, there's always some finite limit to our cognitive abilities, the cognitive capacity of our minds, if you like. And there are very few ways that we can extend the scope of cognitive, these cognitive limits to build more complex systems that exceed those limits. We could think really hard, we could study really new things and learn more, but that's it. We can work to increase our own capacity, but this is very seriously limited in how far that can take us. The much more scalable approach is to divide up the problem into many smaller pieces, each of which fits within our cognitive capacity. So now our ability to solve problems is effectively unlimited, at least within the limits of what's physically possible. This second approach is how humans really solve problems. We build systems and solve problems that are way beyond the capacity of our minds to hold all of the details. This second unbounded approach isn't limited by the capacity of our minds. Now this is still true even for AI, where it's easier to imagine them being able to improve their own mental capacities way beyond ours. Being able to solve problems incrementally in smaller steps is still always the more scalable solution, even if your mental capacity is a thousand times mine. Whatever the size of the measuring stick doesn't alter this, the truth of this statement. But currently, this isn't how AI writes code at all. If you specify what you want from an AI system, it generates the code from scratch. If you ask it to do it again, it generates it from scratch again, often doing things differently each time. So we've lost reproducibility, and with it, the ability to correct missteps and grow complex systems incrementally. Even if we save all the inputs in version control, we've lost version control over our own solutions. This seems like a pretty serious limitation of what AI code generation can actually do to me. Until AI can refine, refactor, and add to the design of pieces of software, it will be limited by its own mental capacity to understand. Only when it's able to work incrementally and build on sound foundations that it's already established in previous steps will it be as capable as we are as human beings at solving problems even if its mental capacity is greater than ours. Working incrementally in small steps is the more powerful tool here, and we achieve that by better controlling the variables through version control. Thank you very much for watching. 
And if you're a Patreon member, thank you very much indeed for your support. If you're not yet a Patreon member, do consider supporting the channel by checking out the links in the description below. There are good offers all of the time available to Patreon members. Thanks again.